Good afternoon. I am Bruce Keppen, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of Quinnipiac University's Frank H. Schneider MD School of Medicine. I am pleased to welcome you and to officially open this commencement ceremony for the class of 2020. I believe none of us wanted to be celebrating in this virtual fashion, but we are nonetheless grateful to have the chance to be together this way and to celebrate you, our class of 2020. It is now my privilege to introduce Judy Olian, president of Quinnipiac University. So pleased to be here to celebrate with you this remarkable achievement in each of your lives, um, as close as we can be to in person. Completing med school and embarking on your residencies and careers in healthcare is an unforgettable, life-changing milestone. I think it's fair to say that this year, for this graduating class, it's an even more transformative milestone given our current circumstances. The personal sacrifices you'll make and the life-changing impact you will have are never more evident than at this moment in our history where doctors are saving lives every minute, despite what might be grave personal risks that they're taking upon themselves. This is real. This is what you chose to be. And we are humbled by your values, your selflessness, your single-mindedness to save lives. You are all our heroes. As each of you fan out across the country to hospitals and doctor's offices and other healthcare settings near and far, I'm reminded of a very simple quote from Dr. Seuss. To the world, you may be one person, but to one person, you may be the world. As evidence of that, I note that last week, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson named his newborn son, Wilfred Laurie Nicholas Johnson. Nicholas is the name of the two doctors who saved the prime minister's life as he was fighting COVID-19. His son will carry his father's gratitude to his doctors for life. As doctors, you will touch a life, you will touch many lives in very meaningful and personal ways, some of which you will not even be aware of, whether it's because you restore someone to health or because you take time to touch their soul, you'll have an impact on that person or that person's loved ones forever. Before I go on, let me pause and acknowledge the most important part of today. Let us celebrate graduates. You are now doctors. Savor the moment, this remarkable accomplishment and the journey that brought you here. You're entering a profession that desperately needs your expertise and your compassion. Even before the pandemic, the Association of American Medical Colleges, AMC, in its 2019 report, projected a shortfall of between 40,000 to 122,000 physicians over the next decade. 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every day imposing even greater demand on our healthcare systems to care for an aging population. Six in 10 Americans currently live with at least one chronic disease, many of which are preventable or can be controlled with the help of physicians like you. These needs are especially acute in the numerous marginalized communities in the US and worldwide that are medically underserved. You're already addressing these needs by extending your care and dedication to local and global communities. You've cared for medically underserved communities of the greater Bridgeport area through the Bobcat Community Health Alliance, a student-run medical organization. You've taken part in Science Fridays at schools in New Haven, where you led interactive science experiments. You volunteered at local clinics. You've participated in NEDER's Health Careers Pathway to increase underrepresented students entering the health professions, and you introduce basic concepts of neuroscience to eighth graders. And as our state and nation grappled with the rapid spread of COVID-19, you stepped forward to help 
You connected with vulnerable seniors feeling isolated. You staffed a crisis line for individuals in need. You created masks for healthcare workers and gathered and donated other forms of PPE. You delivered groceries to vulnerable families and you fanned out to food banks and soup kitchens around Connecticut. And somehow, with all this giving, you still found time to manage a challenging course load and produce scholarly work. One capstone project examined discrepancies in the level of care for patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities, resulting in a grant that will continue the program this coming year. Another project tracked homelessness in Connecticut hospitals with results presented to the UN Commission for Social Development, as well as to the Connecticut Hospital Association. And I could go on and on. From what I know and hear, I am confident that each of you is ambitious, talented, caring, and curious. You conduct yourselves with integrity and decency. You are living role models of our Quinnipiac values and what it means to be a Bobcat. As you go forth as Quinnipiac alumni, I'm certain that you will help others as you have been helped along the way, whether mentoring future generations of physicians who follow you, assisting neighbors and those in need in your community, or spending time with patients who need and seek your compassion and oftentimes just want someone who listen to them. I encourage you to remain curious and open to the new and to continue learning and growing. In our rapidly changing world, we do not yet know what we will need to know or what medicine will look like in 10 years, in five years, or even in a year. Who would have predicted these times even five months ago? Prognosticators assert that artificial intelligence will revolutionize diagnostic practices by crunching huge amounts of data in seconds. That Alexa will soon be able to diagnose disease. That robots and drones will deliver prescription medications or collect blood samples. And that telehealth will become ubiquitous as we've seen during the coronavirus pandemic. While we can't predict the future with certainty, what we do know is that to be successful, enlightened, and accessible to many different populations, we must keep learning, we must keep changing. At Quinnipiac, we hope to remain your touch point for life, where you keep learning, stay in touch with those who are your mentors and role models, and return to recharge and reconnect with your original purpose for becoming a doctor who ministers to others. Please know Quinnipiac will always be your home and we hope you come back often. I hope and expect that you'll remain connected to your classmates and that you'll continue to draw on the many friendships formed here for the rest of your lives. Look, you are lucky, you are gifted. Without both, luck and talent, you wouldn't be celebrating this milestone today. And because of that, as John F. Kennedy said, to those whom much is given, much is expected. Remember to share your blessings and to give back. We will be forever proud of you and will follow your life's journey with great interest. Please remain a Bobcat for life. Stay connected wherever you land. So congratulations. Class of 2020, you've already made your mark and we can't wait to see how you continue to change the world. And right now, the world needs more kind, compassionate, noble people like you. Thank you. Thank you, President Olian. Dear members of the class of 2020, I am quite certain that when you were welcomed into the Netter family, and received your white coat and stethoscope, this is not what you expected your commencement ceremony would be like. Well, it's not what we had planned for you either. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, the coronavirus has impacted all of us in ways we could never have imagined even a few months ago. This pandemic has tested us all, but you have adapted in remarkable fashion. You celebrated your capstone projects and match day results remotely, and today you graduate remotely. 
Your resili resiliency is truly amazing, and I am in awe of you all. While the pandemic changed the plans you had made for your final weeks at Netter, it could not stop you from wanting to help in this crisis in any way you could through numerous volunteer activities, some of which President Olian uh, just uh, spoke about. We are so very proud of you for these efforts. As you leave Netter, I know that many of you will now move to the front lines in this fight. It is normal to feel anxious now and in the coming weeks as you start your residency, but please know that you are ready for what lies ahead. You have already shown the faculty that you have the knowledge, skills, and compassion to make a difference in people's lives. Be confident, be eager, and be strong. One thing this pandemic has done is given me time at home and the opportunity to enjoy again some of my favorite movies. In watching the first Lord of the Rings movie, I was struck by an exchange between Frodo Baggins and the wizard Gandalf. In this brief exchange, Frodo tells Gandalf of his unease at being the keeper of the ring and says, I wish it, excuse me, I wish it need not have happened in my time. To which Gandalf replies, so do I, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. I am sure you did not wish the pandemic to be in your time. Indeed, no one did, but it is here. And now you and we all must act. I am confident that you will decide to make the most of this time that is given you. In closing, I encourage all of you to take pride in your accomplishments and celebrate today with your friends and family. You have done so much and you will do so much more. On behalf of the faculty and staff, we wish you well, with much joy and happiness in your careers. You are and always will be a member of the Netter family. Please stay in touch and keep us apprised of all the great things you accomplish. Congratulations. It is now my pleasure to introduce Luba Kanapasik, Senior Associate Dean for Education, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Dean Kepin. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. William McDade. Dr. McDade serves as the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, the ACGME. And in that role, he leads efforts to increase physician diversity and ensure inclusive clinical learning environments in our nation's residencies and fellowships. Dr. McDade is a graduate of the University of Chicago's Pritzker School of Medicine. He completed residency training in anesthesiology at the Mass General Hospital. He then returned to Pritzker to join the faculty where he served as professor of anesthesia and critical care, deputy provost for research and minority issues, and associate dean for multicultural affairs. Prior to joining the ACGME, he served as executive vice president and chief academic officer for the Ochsner Health System in New Orleans, where he oversaw the system's undergraduate, graduate, and continuing medical education and allied health programs, and shaped its research agenda. Dr. McDade is nationally recognized as a champion for the elimination of health disparities and for diversifying the medical workforce. He has served on a number of important national organizations, including the National Board of Medical Examiners, and is currently on the boards of the Joint Commission and the American Medical Association. As you might expect, he has received numerous awards for his incredible work. Please join me in welcoming Dr. William McDade. Thank you, Dr. Konoplasik. Good afternoon, Dean Kepik, uh, President Olian, and graduates of the class of 2020, parents and families, friends, esteemed colleagues of the faculty of the Frank H. Netter School of Medicine, ladies and gentlemen. It was 30 years ago that I was in your position as a newly graduated medical student about to embark upon a career in medicine. The excitement and anticipation of the next phase of my preparation to serve humanity was only slightly distracted by the trepidation of moving to a new city learning a new healthcare system, 
and taking on the role of writing orders that do not need to be co-signed. However, this year is a bit different. One of the intentions of the creation of the Netter School of Medicine was to produce a class whose goals were to improve the health of our society by emphasizing primary care. In your class of 82, 60% of you are preparing to enter primary care fields. I commend you for this commitment to serve in this important role that's the bedrock of the patient-physician relationship. It's always what doctors have done in the practice, and it is the practice of medicine. However, circumstances are much less certain now that, than in recent memory. The SARS-CoV-2 virus has made things notably more complex. You, like many of your cohort nationally, have been out of the direct patient care role for the past several weeks because of COVID. Many of you have taken on, in these past weeks, the ability to serve in food pantries or to fabricate masks or to man crisis phone lines. I wouldn't have expected anything less from a group of people who plan to dedicate their lives to service. Yet, you're about to step into a far more challenging endeavor full on in the ensuing weeks. With so much uncertainty about the nature of the viral illness, its diagnosis, management and treatment, the aftermath of exposure, the extreme variability of predictive models of population disease incidents, and the risk to loved ones and yourself through exposure, the idea of the physician's role in the social contract is being tested in emergency rooms, clinics, and ICUs across the country. Education in the time of COVID is being tested for creativity. As we strive to understand how to teach all the things we felt were essential prior to COVID's onslaught, yet manage to care for the increasing number of patients stricken with the virus. At the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, we have the responsibility of ensuring that the quality of your education leads to for patients now and in the future and that you're taught in a supervised, high-quality, humanistic learning environment that is characterized by excellence in clinical care, safety, and professionalism. We try to ensure that residents and fellows achieve specialty-specific proficiency prior to graduation and that they're prepared to be rigorous and virtuous physicians who place the needs and well-being of patients first. COVID-19 has tested the mettle of these aspirations for medical education as we battle the intractable struggle between education and service, altruism and self-preservation, risk and reward, to accommodate the shifting models of healthcare delivery occurring in the epicenter of COVID-19 outbreaks, the ACGME has created three stages of uh, being for sponsoring institutions that allow them to focus on the care of patients as they continue their medical missions. Stage three emergency declaration status allows institutions to continue their educational program, but the ACGME agrees to temporarily suspend enforcement of most of its program requirements to focus on three principal objectives. To ensue, to ensure the safety of patients and learners, the provision of adequate resources and appropriate training for the clinical setting and situation with respect to infection protection. Second is to ensure the safety of patients and learners by providing adequate supervision for clinical circumstance and for the level of education experience of the resident or fellow, and that faculty are appropriately trained to do so. The third is to ensure that the clinical learning environments maintain unchanged limitations set forth in AC common programs. Exceeding the limits of this requirement has been associated with an increase in medical errors, needle stick injuries, and other adverse events that might lead to lapses in infection control. Deviation Patients in this domain could increase risk for both patients and learners. At its maximum, 155 institutions, which account for almost half the residents and training in the country, had declared a 30-day stage three declaration status. It's renewable, but the earliest institutions are reaching the end of their initial temporary periods. And we've thankfully noted a downward inflection of the number of institutions requesting renewal of this status. The executive leadership team at ACGME met daily to ensure that we were doing as much as we could to support institutions and learners during this period. We have created a microsite on COVID-19 information on our main website that has resources and guidance for the medical education community. We've also implemented a weekly national DIO call in which leaders of GME at each institution can come together to share ideas and experiences. We've advocated for adequate situational personal protective equipment for the healthcare team and encouraged the President of the United States
to fully implement the Defense Production Act as we have tried to create uh, a, a sense of well-being in the workforce around COVID. Your own Senior Associate Dean, Dr. Luba Konopasek, has led a group ACGME created to develop a toolkit for well-being, which will be available on our COVID site to help deal with the moral injury, anxiety, and stress from frontline workers who are in a nation's programs. So thank you very much, Luba. However disruptive COVID has been to our educational mission, we've also observed how its initial impact has had a disproportionately devastating impact in particular populations. When it was clear that the elderly and individuals with certain pre-existing conditions had more severe presentation with the viral illness, required ventilation support more frequently, and sustained worse clinical and mortality outcomes, many thought leaders predictor that predicted that COVID would have a disparate impact on minority communities. They were right. Calls from Senator Warren and Representative Presley to release demographically stratified data on incidence and mortality for COVID by district were finally addressed, but not before hotspots like those in Michigan and Chicago released their grim statistics on the impact of disease in the Black and Latinx communities. In Chicago, at the out start of the outbreak, 72 cases uh, percent of the cases and 53% of the deaths occurred in African American individuals despite only about a third of Chicago being African-American. In the South, 63% of COVID deaths in Mississippi, 51% of those in Louisiana, and 44% of those in Georgia were of Blacks. Many speculated as to what might have occurred and several popular theories invoked non-existent inherent biological differences between individuals of different races as a cause. Such tactics have been used in the history of this country since its inception for other racist implications used to justify of marginalized groups, such as slaves. It set the groundwork for the empathy gap that persists to this day. Others have more reasonably related the disproportionate COVID deaths to the underlying racial and ethnic health disparities that already existed in America, and the increasingly recognized social determinants of health, economic inequality, inequality in vocational roles in society, housing, education, and transportation inequality, food deserts, safety concerns, and a host of other factors. Now the concept of how stress impacts health developed in the pediatric literature as adverse childhood events or in other disciplines as trauma-informed care and link now to those stressors in everyday life that then impact the poor health outcomes. The concept of weathering was invoked in a perspective that contributed just this week in the New England Journal of Medicine to caution us not to fall into the trap of accepting a rationale without considering the broader context. President Trump was absolutely correct last year when he said, it's an unbelievably complex subject. Nobody knew that healthcare could be so complicated. As you celebrate the culmination of your initial training in medicine and embark upon your own paths in GME, I'm reminded of the wisdom of one of my favorite poets, Ogden Nash. He's known for short, pithy poems that have great insight. I think this one is well suited to the occasion. It's entitled, old Dr. Valentine to his son. He says, your hopeless patients will live, your healthy patients will die. I have only this word to give, wonder, and find out why. Maintain that sense of wonder uh, that drove many of you in, in, in the love of sciences, physical, biological, and social. Apply a humanistic to all that you do that's appreciative of the differences among individuals and embraces inclusivity. Ask deep reflective questions of yourself about the things you accept daily as true. Find out why. I suspect a number of the graduates celebrated here today will contribute meaningfully to the discovery of solutions to counteract the pandemic. And whether it's in a laboratory, in an ICU, in a clinic, or with a family, in all the work you do, please do your best to understand those who are different from yourself, to break down the empathy gap, and to always strive to do the very best for all patients. I thank you for your service. You are indeed heroes in our country. Thank you. For those comments. Thank you so much, Dr. McKay, McDade, for those comments. Really appreciate that. My pleasure. 
At this time, normally I would be introducing uh, William Paulson, the director of our anesthesiologist assistant program. Uh, however, due to technical difficulties, he cannot join us. So uh, in order to present the candidates uh, for the, the degrees in the anesthesiology assistant program, I would ask Dr. Kim Pham, Dean of, Associate Dean of Students in the School of Medicine to do so. I'm pleased to introduce the candidates for the degree of Master of Medical Science, Anesthesiology Assistant. Ramandeep Chohan. Cameron Combs. Cassandra Tolner. Addison Betch. And Paige Victor. Thank you. Madam President, I have the honor to present from the Frank H. Schnitter MD School of Medicine candidates for the degree of Master of Medical Science Anesthesiologist Assistant. By the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Master of Medical Science Anesthesiologist Assistant with all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Congratulations. I would now again ask Dr. Pham to introduce the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Medicine. I am pleased to introduce the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Medicine. Rachel Alade, High Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Arjun Ball, Distinction in Healthcare Management and Organizational Leadership. Claire Barton, High Distinction in Healthcare Management and Organizational Leadership, awarded excellent performance in a required clerkship for family medicine and inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Samuel Baskaroon, Distinction in Health Communications, inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Stephanie Batson, High Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Joshua Bia, High Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research, awarded the Barbara Pober MD MPH Clinical Science Scholarship Award. Jason Baisalon, Distinction in Health Policy and Advocacy. Michelle Blomgren, Distinction in Medical Humanities. Trevor Boris, High Distinction in Healthcare Management and Organizational Leadership. Connor Bracey, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Alexander Buell, Distinction in Medical Humanities inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Nicholas Kalitri, Distinction in Basic, Translational, and Clinical Science Research, awarded excellent performance in a required clerkship for critical care. Lisa Chan, Distinction in Basic, Translational, and Clinical Science Research. Brian Davitt, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Wesley Dean, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Sagar Desai, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Andrew Ding, Distinction in Medical Humanities. Donius Doko, High Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health, inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Carolyn Dubow, High Distinction in Basic, Translational, and Clinical Science Research, received recipient of the Scholarship in Humanism Award. 
Kevin Dagnan, High Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Tavith Dansiri, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Mohammed El Sayed, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Meng Gang, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research, awarded excellent performance in a required clerkship for internal medicine. Meghna Gatu, Distinction in Global Public and Community Health. Britton Gibson, High Distinction in Global Public and Community Health, awarded excellent performance in a required clerkship for obstetrics and gynecology. Lacey Gowdy, High Distinction in Medical Education, recipient of the Leonard Cho Humanism Award. The purpose of the Leonard Cho Humanism Award presented by the Arnold P. Gold Foundation is to recognize the value of humanism in the delivery of care to patients and their families. Also recipient of the Scholarship in Medical Innovation and Education Award and inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Lindsay Hauser, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Jonathan Ho, Distinction in Global Public and Community Health. Paul Irons, Distinction in Health Policy and Advocacy. Yelena Ivanis, Distinction in Global Public and Community Health and inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Diana Joe. High Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Matthew Johnson, Distinction in Health Policy and Advocacy. Connor Casabo, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Alexis Lee, Distinction in Healthcare Management and Organizational Leadership. Dylan Levy, High Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Tony Lee Gung, High Distinction in Healthcare Management and Organizational Leadership. Song Chi Lu, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Jack Liu, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Seo Meniscus, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Awarded excellent performance in a required clerkship for surgery and the Connecticut Chapter of the American College of Surgeons Award. Joanna Marantidis, High Distinction in Healthcare Management and Organizational Leadership, recipient of the Dean's Leadership Award. This award recognizes an individual who demonstrates outstanding leadership to their class and the school. Also inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Kun Chai Mies, Distinction in Health Communications. Terence Meehan, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Aria Manet, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Samantha Moore, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Jalea Moses, High Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Courtney Mullen, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Amanda Nider, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. 
Matthew Noland, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Matthew O'Brien, High Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Hina Patel, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Danielle Patrick, Distinction in Medical Education. Aaron Peritzman, Distinction in Health Policy and Advocacy, inductee into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Peter Padani, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Alexa Policastro, Distinction in Health Policy and Advocacy. Derek Potter, Distinction in Medical Education. Kimberly Quinde, Distinction in Healthcare Management and Organizational Leadership. Vidhi Rao, High Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Kyra Ray, High Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Naveen Kumar Reddy, High Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research and inductee into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Zachary Rupp, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Clark Santee, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Recipient of the Gerald R. Berg, MD Service Award. This award recognizes an individual who demonstrates selfless and compassionate service to the community. Also inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Natalie Shanerjak, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Bosakara Sakom, High Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Paige Stoudenmayer, High Distinction in Health Communications and inductee to the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Melissa Templeton, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Abhishek Thakur, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health, recipient of the Scholarship in Community or Global Health Award. Vithya Thambiaya, Distinction in Healthcare Management and Organizational Leadership recipient of the Connecticut chapter of the American College of Physicians Award and inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Ashley Trin, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research, recipient of the Mesh Preceptors Award for Scholarship in Primary Care. Hawa Tunkara, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. David Turco, Distinction in Health Policy and Advocacy. Catherine Valancourt, High Distinction in Medical Humanities. Siga Vajisek, Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research. Brian Wasicek, Distinction in Medical Education, and awarded excellent performance in a required clerkship for psychiatry. Jordan Wells, High Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health, awarded excellent performance in a required clerkship for emergency medicine. Kevin Wu, High Distinction in Basic Translational and Clinical Science Research, 
recipient of the Stephen Weichel PhD Scientific Scholarship Award. Erica Yu, Distinction in Medical Humanities. Jacqueline Yu, Distinction in Interprofessional Education and Practice and recipient of the Connecticut Academy of Family Physicians Annual Student Award of Excellence. Jessica Yu, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Florence Yuan, High Distinction in Health Communications, recipient of the Connecticut Academy of Family Physicians Schumann Award. Maya Zarabi, Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health, recipient of the Excellence Performance in a Required Clerkship for Pediatrics Award. Kristen Zosilin, High Distinction in Global, Public, and Community Health. Nicholas Zwolinski, Distinction in Healthcare Management and Organizational Leadership. Madam President, I have the honor to present from the Frank H. Schnetter MD School of Medicine, candidates for the degree of Doctor of Medicine. Thank you, Dean. By the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Medicine with all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. My heartiest congratulations. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Florence Yuan, class of 2020, who will give remarks on behalf of the class. Thank you everyone for being here to celebrate with us today, even though this isn't quite the commencement we expected to have. COVID-19 has seeped into every aspect of our lives. And while we may be graduating in the midst of a pandemic, for just a few minutes, I'd like to put that aside and focus on our class and the last four years we had together. We are the fourth graduating class of this wonderful medical school. I like to joke that the Frank H. Netter School of Medicine wasn't really complete until we arrived to make it whole. As a class, we rolled along with the fast pace of education. We jumped into clubs and interest groups and research projects. We filled out many, many feedback forms. Above all, we learned that the only constant in medical school and in life is change. As we plowed through hours and hours of lectures and thousands of flashcards, life plowed along with us and sometimes despite us. Some of us got engaged or married. Two of us became first time parents. Some of us lost close family members and friends. And all of us missed weddings, funerals, birthdays, and other milestones in our loved ones' lives. But we found other ways to make life meaningful for ourselves and each other. From day one, we kept each other going through all-you-can-eat sushi runs, many hot cups of coffee, tea, or hot chocolate, hugs in the hallway, and long conversations during study breaks. We shared study guides and made up practice questions for each other. We texted each other words of motivation to get through a long day of studying or a 24-hour call at the hospital. We also never hesitated to look beyond our little Netter community to the wider world. When I think about what the class of 2020 has done, I think about Clark Santee and Britton Gibson leading the Bobcat Community Health Alliance to provide care for underserved individuals in Bridgeport. I think of Michelle Blomgren fighting for the right to access comprehensive reproductive care. And I think of Julia Moses working to lift up students who are underrepresented in medicine. I think about Alex Buell's efforts to, make, uh, to teach others about lifestyle medicine and the idea that we really are what we eat. I think about Sam Baskaroon and Nick Kalitri helping to put together one of the tasty, tastiest events of the year, the Guac Off, to make sure no kid goes hungry. I think of Carrie Dubose's podcast about amazing women in medicine and science. And I think of Kristen Zuzulin's inspirational global public health work in Liberia and Kenya, and I could go on. Our faculty are just as amazing. They have carried us through the joys and challenges of medical school, 
with patience, humility, and an openness to debate, even if that debate happens at the end of an hour-long lecture. If you've ever walked through campus on Halloween, you know, you know that our faculty knows how to have fun too. And they are some of our biggest cheerleaders. From Dr. Hall emailing us motivational quotes and lighthearted comics before exams, to Dr. Fogarasi carrying bucket upon bucket of water to help us wash the feet of people experiencing homelessness, to Dr. Bona and Dr. Zucconi outpacing all of us at the IRIS Run for Refugees, our faculty truly know how to support us to achieve greater heights. But in the end, so much of what we've done, we owe to all of you in the audience today. You've supported us through our medical school journey, even when you had no idea what we were learning about, and we didn't really know either. <laughs> you've made us food, you've allowed us to test our stethoscopes and reflex hammers on you, and you've put up with us only calling you once a week or month or year. <laughs> I know I would not be wearing this fancy cap and hood today without my parents' unwavering support. I think most of us still can't believe that we're doctors, but all of you believed in us when we didn't have the confidence or energy to believe in ourselves. Even if we don't always show it, we are so grateful for you. I am so proud of us, the class of 2020. Through our time here, we've learned how to deal with challenging situations and support patients through some of the toughest times in their lives. We've learned about how to provide effective care, even in a constantly changing healthcare environment. We've learned that good health is cultivated, not just within the walls of a clinic or hospital, but in our families and communities. The years ahead will not be easy, and we don't know what changes are coming, but I know that if anyone can handle those changes, we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. I would now ask Tracy Marquis Aidman, Associate Professor of Medical Sciences, Medical Student Home Program Director, and Longitudinal Integrated Clerkship Director to now deliver remarks from the faculty. Thank you, Dean Kepin. Dearest members of the class of 2020, a heartfelt thank you for including me in this pivotal and unforgettable day. Some of you may not realize this, but my very first task on my very first day as a Netter faculty member in August 2016 was placing white coats on some of you at your white coat ceremony. You are the first class that I have seen come full circle, and I am overwhelmed with pride and anticipation for your exceptionally bright futures, almost as much as if you were my own children. I can only imagine how full to bursting your own parents' hearts must be. At the same time, I do want to acknowledge the grief and the loss that you might be feeling, and perhaps anxiety and trepidation as, as well, as this moment is really nothing like what you or your families had, had in, envisioned. This time in history does still feel so surreal. I am hopeful, however, that your sense of accomplishment and your family's sense of pride is not diminished one iota by the unusual circumstances of this commencement, but rather that you are feeling only an enhanced commitment to this exceptional calling and profession. When I pondered what messages I wanted to leave with you today in the midst of this unprecedented time, I came upon two general themes. The first one is this, remembering to honor the art of medicine and to place humanity foremost, even as you honor the science and respect the evidence-based algorithms. Or wherever the art of medicine is loved, there is also a love of humanity. While you will never forget the hours and hours and hours that you spent studying biochemistry and physiology and therapeutics, I pray that you will also never forget the faces of your patients and their families, their nuances and their needs, their stories, successes and losses, their goals and their values and their definitions of what living means to them. And that you will be there for them when the abilities of science fall short, when there are no more prescriptions to be written and all that is left is simply to be there and witness to their grief giving them the gift of your single-minded attentiveness. 
because that is what every patient, every human being ultimately deserves, isn't it? To be treated with the utmost dignity and humanity, to know that no matter where they are in their journey, they are not alone. And thus, even in the midst of all this uncertainty and fear, there are some things that remain true. Antibiotics will not cure the common cold. Lifestyle changes do make a difference. WebMD will come up at least once during your days in clinic. There will be snow on the ground in Northern Maine in April, perhaps May, and maybe even June. And what separates a good doctor from a great physician is the great physician's ability to be, a, to be completely and unequivocally present. My second theme is this. There is now and there will always be one other person who will need your compassion, and that person is you. Laura Esquivel said in Like Water for Chocolate, each of us is born with a box of matches inside us, but we can't strike them all by ourselves. Each of you are brilliant, kind, and generous. You are creative, funny, and passionate, but you are also as human as the patient and the colleague in front of you. So if you would allow for flaws in others, if you would be generous in your tenderness and your mercy for others, why would you not allow for flaws in yourself and give yourself that same gentleness? We are told so many times in medicine that the pain is part of the process, that others before us suffered, therefore we too must suffer. But sometimes this natural urge to put our head down and to power through is counterproductive. Reach out, take the hand in front of you, and in other words, reach for your own oxygen mask. Do it for yourself, and please do it for those of us who need you whole. And while you're at it, take the time to breathe and to nourish the other non-medicine parts of you, for they too will make you a better doctor. Allow room in your life for connections to others, whether they be family, friends, colleagues, patients, neighbors, or even strangers. Nurture these connections for they will sustain you. They will add to your sense of purpose and your sense of fulfillment, and they will ultimately be your emotional PPE when you need it the most. And in my final words to you, I have three last tiny requests. One, throughout your hopefully long and illustrious careers, you will undoubtedly encounter many twists and turns that will ultimately offer you two choices. Pessimism or optimism? I am asking you today to do your best to choose optimism, to choose hope. For as I read somewhere recently, one hopeful person will accomplish more than 100 cynics because the hopeful person will always try. Two, please remember your Netter family and know that you will always have a home here with us. Keep us updated along the way. I know I speak for others when I say how much we love hearing from graduates and alumni. Finally, my last piece of advice is keep your head up, your heart full, and your eyes wide open. Eyes always wide open. For every moment, every moment doing what you love is a moment well spent. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marquise Aidman. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joanna Marantidis, president of the class of 2020. Nearly four years ago, with our freshly pressed short white coats in hand, we were told of our daunting road ahead in what would inevitably be some of the most grueling years of our lives. We were told of how our dedication to patient care, our commitment to lifelong learning, and our growing curiosity would carry us forward on our, on our path to become physicians. What we didn't realize was that our short white coats would be along for the journey too. The first two years, that crisp white coat was safely hung in our lockers, making a special appearance for interactions with standardized patients or for our weekly afternoon mesh experiences. Like our white coat, we were eager and bright and excited to take on whatever, whatever challenges lied ahead. Clinical rotation started and, like us, our poor white coat was put through the ringer. As we chugged our coffee during our 24-hour calls, our short white coat got a little taste too, and a nice brown stain on the collar showed the world just how exhausted we both were. The poor front pocket was covered in permanent stains, remnants of pens we had kindly donated to our residents and attendings. 
Its side pockets were stuffed full of patient notes, reference books, and snacks, and soon started to fall apart. As we traveled from rotation to rotation, our once freshly hanging white coat was crumpled and shoved into our backpacks for easy transport, a reflection of how disheveled we sometimes felt after a long day of work and studying. At the end of a long rotation, we would spend the weekend sleeping, spending time with loved ones and recharging. We washed and hung our white coats, both, both physically and mentally, getting ready for a new rotation beginning that following Monday. Our short white coat told the rest of the hospital staff that we were the least experienced on the floors. It was with us as we awkwardly tried to find a place to stand in a patient's room during rounds or tried to be helpful during childbirth. We wore our white coats like a coat of armor when holding a scared patient's hand or telling a patient in their families that the end was near. That little coat reminded us well, that while we wouldn't be the smartest in the room, we could always take the time to be the most kind and compassionate. For many of us, our short white coats were retired early as we, we were abruptly pulled from our rotations as a seemingly out of sight pandemic began to spread throughout our community. Starting residency is already an extremely daunting task, let alone in the midst of a global crisis, but I know the lessons we have learned throughout medical school will carry us through the dark and difficult times that lie ahead. To the class of 2020, we have been continuously tested throughout our four years of medical school and we have persevered. I urge you to reflect on those moments of discomfort or awkwardness you felt while wearing that little white coat. Lean into those moments where you feel like you can't give any more, as those are the moments that will help you grow, both as phys physicians and as humans. Remember that feeling when we put on that short white coat for the first time, scared for the road ahead, but immensely grateful for the opportunity to follow our dreams. While we may be upgrading to a longer white coat in a few weeks, be proud of all you have accomplished to get to where you are today, and don't ever take for granted how privileged we are to care for those who need it most. You are the most ambitious, earnest, and inspiring group of individuals I know, and I encourage you to hold on to those ideals as you begin your career. While this is not quite how we envisioned graduation today, I am so thankful we can still gather to celebrate our accomplishments. I am proud to see how far we have come in the last four years, and I am immensely privileged and honored to know you all, and I can't wait to see how we can, can continue to grow. To the greatest class Netter has ever seen, congratulations and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marin Titus. Robert Bona, Professor of Medical Sciences, will now lead the class in the Hippocratic Oath. Class of 2020, please stand if you are able to recite the Hippocratic Oath. If there are other physicians with us who would like to join us and restate the oath, please do so. We're going to say this together. I swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment this covenant. I will respect the hard won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk and gladly share such knowledge as is mine with those who are to follow. I will apply for the benefit of the sick, all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy, and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. I will not be ashamed to say I know not nor will I fail to call in my colleagues when the skills of another are needed for a patient's recovery. I will respect the privacy of my patients for their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. Most especially must I tread with care in matters of life and death. If it is given to me to save a life, all thanks, but it may also be within my power to take a life. This awesome responsibility must be faced with great humbleness and awareness of my own frailty. Above all, I must not play at God. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart or a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect the person's family and economic stability. My responsibility includes these related problems if I am to care adequately for the sick. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. I will remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, those sound of mind and body, as well as the infirm. If I do not violate this oath, may I enjoy life and art 
respected while I live and remembered with affection thereafter. May I always act so as to preserve the finest traditions of my calling and may I long experience the joy of healing those who seek my help. Congratulations, class. This concludes our commencement ceremony. So on behalf of President Olian and the Frank H. Schneider MD School of Medicine, I again offer congratulations to the class of 2020. As we conclude today's ceremony, I want to thank you all for your patience with today's virtual program. It is our sincere hope that you were able to celebrate and enjoy the culmination of your time with us here at Quinnipiac and that you will remain an active member of our Netter Bobcat family. Now is the time to uncork the champagne. Thank you.